You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film, A Place at the Table, about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com, on demand, backslash A Place at the Table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, we're talking to Solari Jenkins an extraordinary recruiter that worked with the likes of Sun Microsystems and Silicon Graphics and many other high-tech firms. Solari helped to staff management teams and individual contributors that became noted throughout the industry as priceless members of teams that led their company to gain respect and recognition throughout the world. Meet Solari Jenkins. Slory, tell me about yourself and how you got such an interesting name. So I was born in a military family and was actually born in Georgia. And uh, my father was stationed at Fort Benning when he met my mom in Columbus, Georgia, which was the military town closest to Fort Benning. And after they got married and such, they had my brother, who was end up four years older than, than me. And so when I came along, his name was Gage, G-A-G-E. So when I came along, they said that he had pretty much given them four years of hell. So they wanted to bring their new son into this world who would bring sunshine into their lives. So they named me Solari. And so that means rays of the sun in Latin. And so after we were in, in Georgia for a while, we moved to Okinawa. And uh, that was, I guess I was around seven or so when we moved to Okinawa. And then the war broke out in uh, Korea. It got more expanded than what they thought it would. You know, the Americans, for some reason or another, think that any kind of armed conflict, they'll be able to squash it in a short period of time. But that Korean conflict, you know, they had support from the Chinese and all of that. So... They had to send a lot of their troops over there. So our father had to leave from Okinawa to go to Korea during that conflict, which meant that then we would have to cut our time short in in Okinawa. We went to Japan and stayed for a while and then made our way back to the States. And after a while, later on in 53, we moved to Germany. And so the dynamic of my life has been making adjustments. Soon as we get situated, we'd have to move and go someplace. And so in between my father getting dependent housing, we would usually stay with relatives and such. So a lot of times we would be with my grandmother back in Columbus, Georgia. And so I grew up seeing a big discrepancy of what life was in Georgia to what it was out of this country and other places, but especially out of this country. We would go from Georgia to where we were restricted and where we could go. And the good part about it is that I was able to see black ownership in businesses and so forth, the cleaners and the the markets and the taxi cab companies and restaurants, all of these different things that involved our daily lives. So I was able to see that. But there was also that piece of when you get out of this community, there are some restrictions. And then there's oftentimes even some discomfort where people won't treat you with respectability and such. You compare that to what it was like overseas, big difference. I mean, we had maids and gardeners in Okinawa. And later in Germany, because of the, we were in Germany 53 to 58, and the German Dutch mark at that time was worth a quarter. So, you know, the economy was a big difference. So all the soldiers and such, their families, they had maids and so forth. But the deal is my parents 
who were really regular people, insisted that my brother and I had our own duties and chores, keeping our shoes clean, keeping our rooms clean and all of that, as well as participating in the house. So my brother said to my mom once when we were in Germany, he said, well, why do I have to clean my room? We have a maid. My mother said, she doesn't work for you. Go in there and clean your room. <laughs> she insisted that she didn't want us to be beholden or dependent on someone else to take care of ourselves. And that meant keeping ourselves clean and things orderly, as well as knowing how to fundamentally cook and so forth. So moving right along, my father came back. We all came back from Germany. He then retired after 30 years. And he had a, um, a very celebrated uh, 30 years in the military. He joined their Fort Benning's riding team. And he was an equestrian. He won so many events. This is in the in the late 30s and 40s, middle 40s. He won so many events, they made him a judge. And so we're talking about real serious things that he did in performance. He also played on the polo team for Ford Benning. All right. So you hear these people who don't know a lot talking about what black people don't do and such. They don't know our history. There have been people who've done things all along, haven't been written up in these books and now not on Internet. You think we didn't do it. For example, you know, a lot of those comedians talk about what we don't do. I want them to speak for themselves, say what they don't do. Don't speak for you and me. So after we settled in, in East Orange, New Jersey, my father retired. Um, I went off to college in Evansville, Indiana, and then came back and went to Rutgers. And by that time, that's when Vietnam was starting to really heat up. So I got some papers that I was going to be drafted and so forth because I had dropped my course load down to qualitative reasoning and quantitative reasoning, something I was really interested in. So I've always been curious about the mind and how how we think and what makes people do what they do. And then culturally, the differences, because I had lived in different cultures and had been privy to a lot of that. I decided I would go into the military. Well, that made my father very pleased because he was a military man inside and out. My mom was a little concerned. So I thought if I went in, I wouldn't be subjected to being just sent anywhere because they said at that time, 98.6 of all inductees are sent to those trouble spots like Laos and Vietnam. Well, about a year or so later, after going through basic and everything, I was sent to Vietnam. What I say to people though, Kathy, is that I was in Fort Bragg in North Carolina, the home of special forces and such. So I was getting some really good training. So most of my friends were jump qualified. They were paratroopers. And so they said, come on, Jenkins, you're too cool just to be a leg, man. You got to get your wings. So I was getting ready to, to apply to jump school. And that's when I got orders for Vietnam. So I say to people, getting orders for Vietnam probably saved my life from jumping out of one of those planes. <laughs> So once going to Vietnam, I was in an area where we had some special projects and we had some special operations and all of that. I was able to, to survive all of that. Uh, everybody didn't. But one thing I just wanted to share about Vietnam was that I haven't experienced the camaraderie that we experienced there in other parts of my life, except for very few rare occasions. What I mean by that is that if you were short, which means that you had less time to go before you rotated back to the United States, that person was pre protected. When things happened, we got attacked. We had these, these aerial assaults and then somebody coming in with explosives strapped all around their bodies and all these other kinds of crazy things that we had to deal with. Whoever was short. So let's say, for example, it's five of us who were good friends or maybe six or seven of us. Well, of those six or seven people, maybe two of them 
had been there for a while. Maybe they only had two months to go before they rotated back. So as soon as something occurred, those two people were protected as best we could because their chances of making it back alive were far greater than ours who had many more months to go there. All right. And that's a true truism. I mean, really true. And we meant that inside and out 24 seven. Yeah. Well, upon coming back to, from Vietnam, I came back in 66. I was there 65, 66. Well, society had turned its back on us. I said that we were all baby killers and all of that because of the uh, Mi Lai incident and all of that. And then the military turned its back on us as well. So a number of us came back with some kind of illnesses and maladies, and we filed for some benefits and such. They were summarily rejected, especially black soldiers rejected right off the bat. So we stopped. And so many years later, I'm talking to a friend of mine I knew 40 years ago, and I said, well, I, I found out that I actually had PTSD, and I'm working on it, and I'm... And so I said, but I never talked about my experience in Vietnam. She said, well, I know you had been there. I said, how would you know that? She said, because whenever a car would backfire or loud noises, you always reacted. And I found out that you had been in the military. She said, so I knew. I said, well, you know, I had to work on that myself. She said, yeah, I bet you did. Because I remember times you would jump and things and respond. And you always would see where the back door was on things. Okay, you go in a restaurant, I'd always go and see where there was another way to get out and so forth. I mean, you had to have to know stuff or where other people could come in. You had to know that kind of stuff. Yeah. So ended up um, doing a number of things there, got involved in show business, did a couple of off off Broadway plays, did quite a bit of uh, modeling and such, and then got some other people in some of the people that I mentored in that. I later saw them advertising uh, products in GQ and all of that. And I would just smile and say, well, that's, you know, somebody that I showed how to do some of that stuff. And then I had a friend who had moved to California in the Bay Area, worked at Stanford. And so I came out and visited with her for a while. I loved the area and I was really nice. And so we kept in touch, but I didn't come back out right away because Everything was exploding on the East Coast around this time. This was like 69, 70, 71, 72. So a lot of those people who are household names now, they were getting their start in places like in the village and, and other places in New York and New Jersey and so forth. And I was only like 20 minutes by car away from Manhattan. So that's where I spent most of my time. So given all of that, it was difficult to leave that and then pack up for this other lovely place with this great weather out in California. Many years later, in 77, married, had two daughters. My wife and I decided we were tired of those winters and we were tired of what we thought was the general attitude of people interacting with each other. There seemed to be uh, a mean spirit, and there seemed to be like um, less embracing, less welcoming kind of thing. So we both had spent some time separately out in California, decided, well, let's, we know a few people out there and let's come out. Well, I had a friend of mine who was in the military with me and we were writing a lot. And he said that he would put a printing business together. And sure enough, he did. And he said, it would be great if you could be my outside salesperson for my printing business. And he said, in that way, you could get the lay of the land and know where you want to be and all of that. And I said, okay, that makes sense. So we flew out, put our stuff in storage and got out here. And I was disappointed because this business wasn't up to speed to where he had made it sound out to be. So I was disappointed in that and said, okay, now what am I going to do? So here I am with my wife, I've got one daughter about two years old, the other one about eight months or so. But we know somebody in the San Francisco area. We didn't know it was called the Bay Area. Drove up to the Bay Area and stayed with them for a little while. And as soon as we got there, I looked in the paper and saw that they had some openings for people who had some recruiting background. So I had done 
done that and such before leaving the East Coast. So I called up, got an interview, and as life would have it, the receptionist said to me, because they would give you a test, you know, I was courteous and cordial to her and so forth. So she said, whatever the number was, she said, number 11, most people get it wrong, it's C. I said, okay, thanks a lot. So sure enough, when I finished the test, and so they were looking over and they said, come back in, let's go over and they said, wow, you did great on the test. You even got you even got this one right. Wow. Like, okay. <laughs> so when can you start, right? When can you start? So I said, well, you know, I could start as, what about Monday? You know, I figured I could get my suits pressed and everything. We were wearing suits and stuff. This is 77, right? So sure enough, I called my wife and I said, okay, I got this job. And she said, oh, good. How much are you making? I said, I don't know. So what do you mean you don't know? I said, I don't know. That didn't come up. So I found out that it was draw against commission. So what did that do? That motivated me to be very, very competent in this job. So we had this thing as in the agency. They required you to make so many calls a day, like 50 in the morning and 50 in the afternoon. Well, I would observe my colleagues on the phone. Hello, I'm so-and-so from Management Recruiter. That was the name of the company. I'm so-and-so from Management Recruiters. Want to know if I can help you with some of your openings. And they'd say, no. He'd say, okay, thanks a lot. And then they'd call. And I said, I'm not in the telephone calling business. I'm in the placement business. So I would call and I'd say, my name is Solari Jenkins. How are you doing? From I'm from Management Recruiters. would like to know if I can assist you in some of your employment needs. And they'll say, no. I said, well, what about those difficult to fill ones that are still there and you're struggling with, but they're very critical to you? They go, oh, yeah, well, we have some of those, but nobody's been there. I said, well, why don't you give us a try with that? Give me a try with that. And I said, and then after that, we can go from there. And they go, well, that makes sense. I'm not going to lose anything. So that's how I started getting business that management recruiters weren't getting. So all of that was well and good. And within, oh, maybe it was six months, maybe a little over six months, I won a trip, all expenses paid for my wife and I to Maui because of being the highest booking person or whatever, the most business for that quarter. So my wife and I are lying on the beach in Maui having some Mai Tais and saying, oh, yeah, there's no sense in us going out to California. There's nothing out there. What, what our East Coast people were telling us, don't be going, what are you going to waste your time going to California for? But, oh, yeah, that's a big waste of time. Can you pass me another drink, please? <laughs> so that was fine. I, I And my area, they were broken down by a desk. And my desk was manufacturing, which meant that I would, start talking with companies in the valley. So I started knowing them and I would make trips down there. And so I had some interest in, well, at least some curiosity about the valley at this time. But I was fine going to work in San Francisco every day, suited up and the whole nine and then the culture there and all of that. And then I hired a fellow for Levi Strauss, brilliant young, young computer science person. And after a fashion, he moved to San Jose. And so I called him to find out why he had left. I knew that he wasn't making the kind of career progress that he thought he should be making, but he was able to get a $10,000 increase. And he said, I said, but I've heard down there, they're really slow-mo. He said, I thought that too. And he was from New York. He said, I thought that too, but not in this world of technology. He said, so Larry, you would really enjoy this. He said, these are bright, sharp people, and things are moving along really nicely. So I was like, click. After a while, I decided uh, I would investigate areas down there. My first one was with a company that was a IBM knockoff. Okay, this was Amdahl. So they were rather stodgy and such. But the problem with them was that the person who hired me after I was there a little over a week 
she said to me, are you ready to come inside? I was a contract recruiter. She said, are you ready to come inside? I said, not really. I'm still just trying to understand this company. And so she said, well, you need to come inside because I need to move over into employee relations. Well, wait a minute now. Am I in charge of your career? So after a while, maybe two weeks go by, she approached me again. And at this time, I'm now seeing how stodgy they are. It's like they're not moving moving the approvals around quick enough. They're telling me that it's with some VP and that he's slow about that. And I said, well, does he know how important it is once a candidate decides to make a move? They're going someplace. Either they're coming here or they're going someplace. They said, yeah, we've told him that. And I was like, do I want to come inside with this company? So I told her, well, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking. And so that was the shortest tenure I ever had. I had a three-month assignment, and at the end of three months, I was gone. So what did I do? I said, well, is there something else, somewhere else I could go? And I heard of this company called Sun Microsystems. My name means rays of the sun. This is perfect for me. But what I heard about Sun Microsystems was like, it was like the, the old west. It was a lot of people shooting from the hip. It was growing like mad. It wasn't very structured like a lot of other companies. And people were saying, whoa, I don't know if that's a place for anybody. Well, I had a contact. I called. I went and interviewed. And one of the things I say to people, Kathy, do not give your answers in an interview for what you think they want to hear. Speak from your perspective, your experience, your knowledge. So I made a cardinal rule. During the interview, they asked about how I recruited. Well, I had been to one job fair. And so I knew that this company went to job fairs. And I said, well, like everybody else, I go to job fairs. I had been to one job fair. Yeah, I had been to one. The rest of mine, I'd put on an accent and I'd call a company. We'd do ruse calling. That's how I got people. That was way before the internet, okay? And so after I interviewed, they shook my hand and everything, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything for two weeks. So I called my contact. I said, I haven't heard anything. She said, well, they, they're concerned about your ability to recruit. And I said, I'm in the agency business. That's all we do is recruit. What do you mean? She said, well, they said that you had talked about job fairs. I said, yeah, I mentioned that. I, she said, so they were a little concerned. So, you know, again, follow through. If you're concerned, why don't you call the candidate? Nobody called me. So I said, do me a favor. Get the most critical interviewers, the most technical, any of that. Get them and have me come back and let me share with them my, spirit, my experience and knowledge. Sure enough, she did that. So they had these sharpshooters shooting at me, this, that, and the other. What about this? And what about that? And I was like, in my world, absolutely. Let me tell you about that. <laughs> so I got the job. I was like, okay, all right. So sure enough, Scott McNeely, the president at the time, the CEO, he said it was better to seek forgiveness than to ask for permission. So there were a lot of times that people were going in different directions diverse directions as opposed to doing what they were brought in to do. So there had to be a couple of reorgs to get that back in place and such. But I saw some of the brightest people in the whole world working there. And they were bought into building that company to where it became one of the top companies of all times and so forth. So that was a really good experience. Enjoyed that a lot. Did a lot of job fairs where I would actually even put up the booths and such. So you would have many interviews while you were there as opposed to just taking a resume because you have that person right there. You'd see their communication skills. They would give you some highlights and so forth. And while I was talking to people, I'd be underlining some things and such so that when I took them back, the resumes back, I could present those to the managers. They wouldn't have to guess and try to read over the whole resume and such. There are things that experienced recruiters do, which is different than people who are just calling themselves recruiters. I was I was with Sun about four years, four years, and then I I went to uh, SGI, 
Silicon Graphics. And I was able to, you know, their claim of fame, claim to fame was that they were still trying to figure out who they were. So their claim to fame was they were making hardware computers and then they were also having uh, special effects software. So I actually hired some people in their special effects area and so forth in their software out of college who later went to George Lucas and some of those places who are probably millionaires today, naturally. But as they were trying to figure out what kind of a company they were, again, they had one of those situations where they wanted to diversify in terms of bringing in more people of color and such, but they weren't going to any of the HBCUs. If you're looking for black folks, go to where black people are. We have HBCUs, but you don't have them on your schedule. You've got all these college recruiting trips and everything, but you had none. So come on. So we were able to, me and, and one of their um, top engineers, he was working on his PhD at the time, brilliant fellow. So we went to Howard. So we went there and naturally we let them know and everything. We were coming in advance, your placement people in the BSU and all of that. And we bought pizza. So, you know, when you buy pizzas, everybody and their brother is going to come, whether they're interested in what you have to sell or present or not. So there were some who lingered after the pizza was gone and we were able to make a real good presentation. We had some people who were interested. We interviewed quite a few of them, came back with either five four or five resumes that we knew these people were really good and could do very well. Well, didn't happen. They didn't get hired. And companies could get away with not changing up by saying they made a good faith effort. Okay? So they would say that we want minorities and women. After a while, they changed the order and said women and minorities because more women were being hired than the minorities that they found something wrong with. And then that's when they would have that cultural fit kind of thing as an excuse as well. So what does that mean? You feel more comfortable with this person to go have a beer with? Or are we talking about a working situation here? So one of the things that I was able to do later on and working with other companies, after we would have interviews, we'd have a round table discussion. And what I was able to do was to point out some of the fallacies of how people would make their decisions on who they wanted to hire. There would be somebody who would say, well, I don't really know how much Kathy knew about uh, object-oriented programming. And they'd say, well, did you ask her? Oh, well, no, but I just, well, you can't ding her for something that you didn't ask her. You assume because it didn't come up. And then somebody else would say, what does that have to do with this job anyway? I don't even have that. Okay. So I was able to participate in those and kind of push back on some of that stuff that would have a, a, a adverse effect on somebody's candidacy that wasn't relevant. You po your point is that an entry-level person or a person with little experience in that job listing may be required or queried about job requirements that can only be acquired while on the job. They are many times dismissed as unqualified, but a good recruiter would be quick to point that out. So that reminds me, one of the, so when I first got in this, I'll digress for a moment, I when I first got into employment, it was with Snelling and Snelling. They had this big binder that I was supposed to read for the first week or so. Well, they got busy my second day on the job and asked me if I would just practice interviewing. Well, these people are out of work or looking for better work. They didn't need anybody to be practicing. I said, by all means. Well, I happened to speak with a fellow who had been doing shipping and receiving some inventory control, and he was out of work, came across really well, had energy about himself the whole nine. So 
Snelling and Snelling had a policy. You do not let anybody out of the office until you try to get them an interview. So I went through a bunch of, had him back out in the lobby while I went through some old job orders of prior openings and such. So I started calling these people. I called this one and the guy says, no, I'm not in the, in the market to hire anybody. I'm doing three jobs myself. And I said, really? Again, I don't get on the phone just to be going through the motions. I'm talking to somebody. I was like, well, what three jobs are those? He said, well, I'm doing the shipping. I'm doing the receiving. I'm doing the inventory control to make sure we have enough. I said, this could be your lucky day. Now, that was not in that book. I'm sure, okay, I, but that was my feeling. This could be your lucky day. I know about sales. I had been a clothing salesman before and stuff. So he said, well, what do you mean? I said, I have somebody in my office who's done all of that and he's done blah, blah, blah. He said, really? I said, absolutely. And I said, so listen, I'm sure he'd like to talk to you. He said, yeah, well, I certainly want to talk to him. He said, so, so we were supposed to ask, would tomorrow at nine o'clock be good or would two o'clock be better? What is that? They call that assuming the sale. So I wasn't going to jam this guy up with nine o'clock in the morning, not knowing if he's got a suit ready and shine his shoes and all of that. Plus, he had one of those Teddy Pendergrass beers that hadn't filled in yet. <laughs> so I said, I, I said, let's make it two o'clock. I'll tell you his name and He'll be coming from me and blah, blah, blah. Guy said, okay. So I told the fellow, come on back. And I said, okay, I just talked to such and such. And the co-founder of the company is now doing this, that. And as I started mentioning that, his face just lit up. And I said, so he's very interested in talking with you. I said, do you have a nice navy blue suit or dark blue suit or dark gray suit? He said, yeah, I got a nice dark blue. And I said, so... When you leave here, go to the, to the cleaners, get it pressed up really nice and so forth, shine your shoes really good. And then I looked at him. He was a black man. I could talk to him. I said, that, that beard that you got that hasn't filled in yet, I said, you need to shave that. I said, you can grow anything later on after you get the job, but you want to go in there with your best. You only get one impression. You only get one chance at a first impression. So you want to make sure that that one is positive. He said, okay, okay, that makes sense. I don't think anybody had ever told him that before. Sure enough, he went for the interview, got the job. They told me that was the fastest uh, job placement in the history of the company, you're a natural. So I said all of that to say, after there, then I went to another company that was more sophisticated and really good. And at that time, we called it data processing. I was a data processing recruiter. So coming out to the Bay Area and realizing that a lot of this was computing and such, I felt very comfortable. But to your point about interviewing properly, one of the things that you could get burned on, regardless of how hard you work, is the counter offer, where you have somebody you put so much time in and so forth, you've already had the second or third interview where the director is now given his approval for him or her, and that person decides they're not going to come after all. That's a backbreaker. And if you're not smart, you got to start all over again. So you learn some things from that. You learn to say, what other companies are you interviewing with? And why is it that you're interested at this time? Because you need to remind that person the reason why they wanted to leave in the first place. So if they've been passed over for promotions, if they're not getting those plum assignments and projects where products are going out the door so that they can participate in that, they're now frustrated. If they don't have any, any um, foreseeable promotions because their boss is not going anywhere and they don't promote that much anyway, they usually bring in outsiders, that's another motivator for you to want to take a move, make a move. So later. When I asked them, what are you going to say when you give your notice? Now I'm listening very closely because if they say to me, I don't know how they're going to take it and this, that, and the other, well, I'll help talk you through that. 
And now if you seem to be waffling, I'm going to remind you why you wanted to leave in the first place. And so I'll also say to you, now they're telling you that you're going to get all those things that you wouldn't get before. So you had to put a gun to their head for them to treat you in the manner that you have 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 earned in the first place. Is that a company that you want to really stay with that much longer? And I said, and plus now they're wary of your loyalty. They may treat you nice now, but after a while, they're going to be thinking, you know what? We don't have to give him any plum assignments and, and such. We've already got him. He's not going any place or she's not going any place. I said, so never accept a counteroffer. Once you decide and mentally divorce that you're making a move, make that move. Make that move. You can be very, very selective on where you go, but you need to make that move. How long were you at SGI? About a year and a half. And here, let's see, I brought up one of my resumes, about a year and a half. And I moved, I had one group that I was with, and then they had a change in management. And then I had another group, and they had a change in management. So it was kind of, it was kind of unsettling there for me. It was kind of unsettling. So I left there and I put together my my uh, art gallery called Solari's Crossing. Right. So I had I had artifacts and art from around the world, statuary and all of that. It was gorgeous and so forth. But after a while, I needed to finance that thing because, you know, now I didn't have a lot of money's coming in. And that's when I went to Sybase. So Sybase was one of those relational database companies. And they were in much better shape than um, Oracle. They were they were the, the big guys on, on campus pretty much. But they made a mistake by having a product that came out that was more buggy than it should have been. They recalled it, and that was like shooting their toes off because then Oracle filled that void and took over that space and everything. They still were able to compete later, but not to the degree where they were before. So did Sybase give you the funds to go back in that world of art and art galleries? Oh, no, no. So then I went to Lamb Research down in Fremont and so forth. So I got to Lamb, and um, I had the largest division there, Metal Business Unit, and did very well with them. And what I liked about Lamb was they also had a group called specials engineering so specials engineering meant you're a customer and we have these machines and i think the lowest price machine was like five hundred thousand dollars and it went on up from there right so we had these machines that did these discs and all of that that then people made microchips out of and all of that kind of stuff very highly technical stuff that was really a good stuff it was really good if you took care of your of your quality control because you can make one mistake and you'd be throwing out thousands of dollars hundreds of thousands of so specials engineering was you like our products you're using them but you would like them to do another function so you would say that to us and we would then connect you to specials engineering that's an engineer who speaks to customers, okay, and can understand what the customer is saying. So now the good news is you're working with the engineer. The bad news is you're working with the engineer. So you're making all of these engineering change orders and so forth, driving these people crazy. But after a while, you come up with this other product. The customer is happy, and now you can add that to your regular offering of products. Not only do we have these, but we even have this. So specials engineering, I thought, was a real exceptional way to do business that also utilized engineers who wanted to spend more time with customers and see what the market really wanted. I thought that was brilliant on their part. Yes, it was. There are many technical people that are very good communicators, but they're looked down as maybe not having the high level of technical knowledge. But this job sounds like it took um, all those things into account and uh, all their skill sets were considered. 
That's great. Yep. And what it did was it reduced a lot of their uh, people from leaving the company who wanted more than just nuts and bolts kind of things, ones and o's and so forth. Now they had something to go into that also gave them an opportunity to utilize those skills of communicating and understanding what the customer needed and what would be happening in the market and so forth. Speaking of that, there was, I'm thinking, is that the same company? It was either LAM or it was Quantum that I went to next um, that we had futures engineering. So that meant that we'd have these conversations and I would be there as their recruiter in this group and futures engineering, where was engineering going in the future related to our products? And so naturally they would be uh, reverse engineering competitors, products and all of that kind of stuff. But then these engineers would be talking about where they saw technology going. Well, this one fellow was saying, and I could see a time when, and this was like in the 90s, late 90s. He said, I could see a time when we would have the same kind of um, firepower with our technology that was so small that you could probably have it on your arm. And I said, you mean like Dick Tracy? And the guy looks at me and he's like, who's Dick Tracy? Yes, the generation gap can be demonstrated in the most startling ways. Once in a training class, I asked the participants to define uh, the words that I'd written on the board, and one of them was swing. And so the older generation, uh, my older than me, saw it as a dance. Uh, my generation, we saw it as a uh, playground instrument or something that you played on. And then the younger generation saw it as a sexual movement. And still another uh, had a different idea. So it just depends sometimes on when you were born as to how you relate to some of the words and uh, movements that are going on. Now, I'm going to show you how coincidental that is. One of the words that we would use was hook up. Well, yeah, we'll, well, we could hook up at such and such. We meant just connecting. I used that, and people took it as a, as a sexual thing, that you hooked up sexually. I was like, no, that's not what I was talking about. So I had to stop using that expression. Isn't that something? Yeah. So from there, I went to Quantum. That was a great company. They had, they had, uh, they were tops in in the hard in the disk drive business, including as well as their desktop hard disk drives, solid state system. They ranked number one in those categories for a period of time. Like most of these companies, when you're doing very well, you're treated well. The only time it gets really dicey and and more backstabbing or just backstabbing in, in, is when they start having layoffs and people are are trying to secure their particular turf or their job and so forth, right? So one of the motivators for me to do an excellent job wherever I went and to work hard at it was because whenever that big sickle of, of uh, cutbacks would be walking around with somebody having it, looking in different offices or cute, I didn't want them to look my way. Didn't want them to look my way. And the second reason why I worked so hard is because I realized that I was a stereotype buster. Whatever preconceived notion you had about people with this coloration and so forth, I was going to blow that out of the water. And so sure enough, I worked longer and harder. Plus, most of the time I had a long commute so there was no reason for me to jump in, in my car and sit in traffic for a couple hours when I could be doing some work in the office. So what I strived to do was to not be right even with hiring managers' expectations. I wanted to be above and, and in front of those. So when you came into your office tomorrow morning, you already had resumes that were either on your desk or on your computer and so forth. So that was one of the those were the reasons I did that, as well as should I refer somebody, I didn't want any second guessing. They'd say if Samari gave his approval, it must be okay. 
So I was able to open the door and bring other folks who looked like us in. You know, some of the uh, so-called innovators of, so- of Silicon Valley were, in their lifetime, the smartest kids in the class, and uh, they had been set aside and treated differently, much like uh, outsiders in some cases, and now they had found their tribe. Uh, but because of the treatment they experienced, they had some knowledge of what it felt to be an onlooker, not be chosen as first. They were... Uh, smart and empathetic enough to realize that that we had been left out. And at the same time, they appreciated an, our drive, our willingness. And many times after working side by side, they encouraged us to find others like us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and people with a different uh, uh, background and life experience will bring different perspectives to things. I, I, so one of the things I, some of the young people today, bless their hearts, they think that it is some kind of a moral imperative for people to uh, diversify in terms of their hiring and such. Bottom line, people are looking at bottom line. If, for example, somebody gets some funding for a startup and they're looking for their additional funding and such, they do not care what these people look like who are working for them as long as they can move forward. So you have to make a business case for why they should stop just hiring everybody who looks like them and their friends. And we've got a story to tell. I mean, that's another reason why it's important for history lessons to reflect the truth of who did things and and invented things and furthered and enhanced things systems, procedures, processes, and products. You've got to have uh, someone that has the skills and the ability to meet the specs of the job, and not only that, to flourish in the job and be a uh, a champion for the company and help the company forward. And there's plenty of us out there, uh, and the best recruiters and the good recruiters get them in and uh challenge them and nurture them so that they are successful. Absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to just insert here is that being a recruiter, it's incumbent upon you to get the job done. You have so many openings and such, and however you do it, your job is to get those things, those openings filled. So I had this one fellow who would not return my calls at one of of these companies. He had like six jobs, and each time my boss would say, "How are you coming on those?" And I said, "I can't, I can't uh, get in touch with them. I left them email. This was not that terribly long. I left them emails. I left them voicemails." He said, "Well, you know, those jobs are really critical." So I called his admin, and I found out when he's in his office when he takes lunch. And she says he doesn't go out; he eats in his office. So I knew what time. So I put a some resumes in, because I had the job descriptions, and so I put some resumes in, a, in an envelope, drove over to his office, came inside, and uh, he had his door open, and I just walked in, and I said, uh, I'm Solari Jenkins, and I said, I've been trying to reach you, and so he said, well, you see, I'm trying to have lunch. I said, I'm not going inter- to inter- interrupt that. I said, you can continue having lunch. I'll talk. I'll talk. You're not going to have me to fail in this job, pal. Okay, I'll talk. So sure enough, I started going down the list. This one you talked about, and this resume, I think is good for that. And he's got such and such. After a while, he put a sandwich down. He said, let me see that. Let me see that. So long story short, he interviewed a bunch of people, end up in another couple of weeks or so, hired all of his people for him and so forth. Then he called me and talked about wanting to go to lunch. I told him I was too busy. I was too busy. I said, you know what I do around lunchtime? That's my time to interview people when they can get away. So I do um, some career counseling, and I help people who sometimes they'll find me on LinkedIn, and other times it's people who know me and sometimes who are relatives or friends of somebody. And recently, there's a friend of mine who's, whose grandson is a uh, professor in uh, physics and computer science. Brilliant. Uh, 
and he hadn't looked for a job in a while. He was sending out resumes, wasn't getting any responses. So uh, she introduced him to me and also gave him my book that she had, my book that I wrote. And so he, sure enough, he talked. I said, send me your resume. Let me take a look. And I'll just share with you more times than not, most people put on their resume the laundry list of things that they're responsible for, as if that's something magical because of the volume of responsibilities. But it does not speak about how you executed these things you're responsible for. You can say, while being responsible for such and such, was able to, okay? If I'm the hiring person, I know what the responsibilities are. You're not dazzling me with that. I want to know what you've done with it. Remember, we would hear about the month end close and the quarter close from those financial and accounting people and so forth. Well, if we read a resume that somebody talked about how they had developed a system that they could close in a week rather than three weeks, we want to talk to that person. <laughs> <laughs> so this fellow that I helped recently, he now is a proud owner of a brand new job that he says, Larry, if it wasn't for you, no, he calls me Mr. J. Mr. J, if it wasn't for you, I don't know what. He said, thank you so much. So one of the things that I did, I brought a humane quality to this function. I didn't, one, I didn't interrogate people. I made them comfortable so I could get the most out of them where they would be natural. If we flew in somebody, they were already on, on, on um, um, uh, jet lag or something by fly, flying in. So they were uncomfortable with this and they would normally be required to make a presentation you know, especially like we're talking about post-grad, post-doc grad students and such coming in. So I would meet with them first and calm them down. One of the things I would say to them is that, listen, this company is not doing you any favors by flying you out here. We flew you out here because we believe you can do this job. So calm down and be about who you are. Share what you've experienced. Don't worry about what you think they may be looking for is from what you put on your resume, the things that you've done, the now projects that you're working on. Speak from your vantage point, your perspective. And they go. So, Kathy, you know, the four agreements, right? So in the four agreements, one of them is being impeccable with your word. Second one is don't take anything personally. Third is don't make assumptions. And the fourth is always do your best. So being impeccable with your word will take you a long way. Sounds like you have a lot of information to share. And uh, I understand you've written a book. Let's call in quest of that elusive thing called a J-O-B. From an insider's perspective. Four star review is it four or five star review? Five star reviews on Amazon. I I wrote it in uh, 2016, published it then, and what I'm working on now is some um, updated version of it. I'll add some things to it, uh, but it is still helping people like I wanted them to. And what is the name of that book again? Just so we all know. Let's call in quest of that elusive thing called a J-O-B. You'll enjoy it. There's a little humor in there. It's very interesting. Good reading. You'll smile while you're reading it. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Thank you, Solari, for sharing your life yeah. and career with us. It has been my distinct pleasure and honor to talk with you Thank today. You. You are an inspiration to all of us that worked in the field of recruitment and a game changer for those that might choose to enter the field today. Your book, The Quest to Find That Elusive Thing Called a J-O-B, you say it's available on Amazon and a must-read for every recruiter and job seeker. Thank you again, Solari, for your wonderful story, and thank you for listening.